Hello, everybody. Welcome to Community Bible Study. If this is the first time you have tuned in, my name is Patty Peretti. I'm the teaching director of the Midland Park Community Bible Study class in New Jersey, and I am very happy to be studying 1 Peter with you. Our core groups are continuing on. They are meeting remotely through Zoom. If you have not been part of one of those conversations yet and you would like to be, please do notify your core group leader and she will get you connected to that conversation. Also, I just want to suggest that if you haven't registered yet for our next year's study, uh, that you would do that pretty quickly. We fill up. Uh, we end up with a waiting list very often, especially for the children's uh, department. So if you would please sign up quickly, uh, we would all appreciate that. I always hate to turn anybody away, especially young moms with little ones. Uh, so if you, could, um, if you could register soon, that would help me sleep better at night. We are opening our registration up to the outside of just our current enrollment uh, towards the end of April, I think the third week of April. So um, if you want to get a spot for your little person, now would be a good time to do that. We're going to be studying the Gospel of John next September, along with every other CBS class in the United States of America uh, as a way of study celebrating a, a, a very um, wonderful anniversary for CBS. So it's going to be an amazing study and um, I'm sure by September you are all going to be delighted to be back in a room with other people. So please do register. All right, open up your Bibles please if you have them to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and we'll get going. If you have been with us from the beginning of this study of 1 Peter, you'll know that uh, the idea of Christian suffering is a major theme that runs throughout Peter's left letter. And it's this issue, Christian suffering, uh, that Peter devotes most of his attention for the remainder of the letter. It's the central idea from about verse 8 of chapter 3 pretty much to the end of the letter. And the first section that we're going to tackle today is chapter 3 from verses 13 through 17, uh, where Peter talks about unjust suffering. Now, we know that the early church faced a constant threat of persecution, and Peter primarily addresses those believers who faced opposition and danger because of their faith, and he warns them in this letter that it may be getting worse for them. He gives them clues like, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you from verse uh, 12 of chapter four. You get a sense that all the suffering, although the suffering is there and present, it is not yet full blown at the time of this writing, but he's warning that is it's coming. Uh, now, even though Peter is speaking to those who are persecuted. Uh, the same principles apply to other suffering as well. So even though we are not going through the kinds of persecutions that the early church endured, um, the same principles still apply to us. And honestly, it gives us some much needed and timely advice and instruction for what we are all going through right now, how we can live and continue to honor Christ in the midst of unjust suffering and grief and loss. Uh, I want to begin by reading those five verses, chapter 3, starting at uh, verse 13. Father, we ask that you would help us, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would help us to listen well to your word and to understand that we would learn it so well that it would be evident in our lives. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good than if, sh if that should be God's will than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I think the fact that Peter devotes so much time and attention to our unjust suffering points to the great kindness and mercy of God. You see, God knows that when things go wrong for us, when we suffer, our first reaction is often, oh, God is mad at me. He's angry, he's displeased, or maybe equally likely, God has abandoned us or maybe is just distant and doesn't know or doesn't care about the details of our lives. Those are our temptations. They have been my temptations. And Peter writes so extensively on this subject so that we would not think those things so that we would not needlessly torture ourselves and carry false guilt or be insecure about God's love for us. If you are sitting there thinking, man, I am getting a little tired of hearing about suffering. I mean, I get it, right? But he does this for a reason. He's not just consumed with this for no reason. He is trying to ease our burden and help us to know what is correct to expect. He tells us not to be surprised when we suffer. Not only not to be surprised, but to expect it and to see our suffering as an opportunity for blessing and witness to the glory of Jesus Christ. Paul writes uh, to encourage a group of bewildered Christians living as exiles in a world to which they do not even belong, who are scratching their heads in confusion, trying to wrap their brains around all that is going on around them, trying to make sense of it all. Does that sound maybe a little bit familiar right now? Are we not all trying to make sense of the world? What is going on right now? How long is this going to last? What is the reason? What is God doing? In Peter's day, I am certain that people were thinking, hey, wait a minute. I thought if I signed on for this new life in Christ, pursuing him, pursuing truth, pursuing the Lord, I thought things would go well for me. I wasn't expecting to have to fear for my life. And can you imagine Peter and the other apostles who were engaged in evangelism? What a difficult message they had to give. Basically, come follow Christ. He is our hope and our answer to life. He is the resurrection and the life. And oh, by the way, you very well may be persecuted and you might even lose your life. That's a tough sale. And frankly, it's still a tough sale, even now. If you want to find your life, you must lose it. You must surrender your life to the one who gave it to you, to the one who owns it. For we were bought with a price. But Peter, as the glorious apostle of hope that he was, has this unbelievable ability to turn trouble upside down and sideways 
And he says in verse 14, even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. If you suffer for Christ, for he is righteousness, we could just as easily take the word righteousness out and put the name of Christ in because he is our righteousness. If you suffer for Christ, you will be blessed. And then he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. You might suffer even though you've done good and you will receive a blessing, maybe not in this life, but in the next. There will be a blessing. A blessing in heaven is better than a blessing here anyway because there we will see fully here we see in part and we know in part. Then he says, don't be afraid and don't be troubled. Now, I think that's a little bit interesting. I get the have no fear of them. Don't be afraid. That's pretty straightforward and understandable. I mean, if you knew there were people who wanted to harm you, you would be afraid, right? But he adds, and don't be troubled. That may have a slightly different shade of meaning. Now, this is just my own spin, honestly, so it really might not be worth very much. But I'm wondering if that nor be troubled clause includes more than just fear of physical harm. Could it also include this emotional torture that we like to put on ourselves, those endless questions about the fairness of, of my suffering that we tend toward? Maybe he is saying, do not expend your mental and emotional energy reviewing over and over. How could this be happening to me? Why is this happening to me? When will this end? We tend to do those things. We tend to say those things to ourselves. In fact, some of us don't even have a category in our brains for unjust suffering. We just think that if we do everything right, things will work out for us. We think that the world is fair that way. Maybe he's also saying, do not be distressed by the unfairness of your suffering. Don't make a career out of concentrating on its injustice. Remember Jesus, when he was threatened, he continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Continued entrusting himself. That is an ongoing thing. It is not a one-time trusting. It was an all-the-time trusting that he calls us to as well. It's a disposition of trust. And I just love that phrase. I don't know, but in my brain, it tends to make a difference. I can look at a single time and place and event and say, I trusted the Lord. I trust the Lord with my salvation. I trust the Lord with my children and my family and my marriage. I trusted the Lord that time to get me through that thing but a disposition of trust is one that leans into the Lord at all times for all things in all ways. It's a constant thing. It's a knee jerk go to default reaction. And Jesus had it. He did it. He continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly, and I would like to do the same. Jesus could entrust himself to his father because he is just, and his father can be relied upon to judge justly at all times. Have no fear, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. How is it 
that you are prepared to make a defense to whoever asks for a reason for your hope. How? How do you have, how do you be ready like that? Not by memorizing lists of things to say in that moment. How can you be ready? According to this verse, by honoring Christ the Lord as holy. If you do not honor him as holy in your heart, you will not be ready to give a reason for your hope. Our devotion to Christ is what makes us ready. The focus should be on honoring Christ, not in preparing your arguments. Then we will be able to give a reason for our hope. Honoring Christ in our hearts is the end of fear. Have no fear of them, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. You see, he's making a connection between having no fear and honoring Christ. Honoring Christ is the antidote to fear. Honoring Christ with our words is the beginning of witness, showing others the reason to have hope, the reason for our hope. Have no fear, but honor Christ as holy in your hearts and be ready to give a reason for your hope. When Peter says in verse 14, have no fear of them, he is alluding to a verse from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 8. And I think that passage from Isaiah sheds a little more light on what Peter is saying here. This is what it says. Uh, you see the Lord, um, before I read the verse, the Lord spoke to Isaiah about how to react to his enemies at his time. And Peter is referring to the same passage and applying God's words to their enemies at their time. And we can take that same passage and that same advice and apply it to our fear in our time. This is what it says, Isaiah 8, starting in verse 11. For the Lord spoke to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, do not call conspiracy all that this people call conspiracy, and do not fear what they fear nor be in dread, but reverence the Lord of hosts. Let him be your fear, let him be your dread. Don't fear what they fear, but reverence the Lord. That sounds a lot like have no fear of them, but honor Christ in your heart as holy. You see the connection between Isaiah 8 and 1 Peter 3. Isaiah again, let him be your fear and let him be your dread. So he is exchanging fear of people for fear of God. Now that would sound pretty scary actually and not very inviting were it not for the very next line in Isaiah 8, 8 14 where Isaiah says and he meaning God will become a sanctuary if you reverence the Lord if you honor Christ as holy he will become a sanctuary you know what a sanctuary is it's a place you run to for safety and peace. It's a place you go to when you are terrified and in danger. It's a place of hope and a place of rest. It is hope. Christ is the reason for our hope. God is our hope and he is our sanctuary. And when we cherish him, he becomes our sanctuary and our hope. This passage in 1 Peter reminded me of another one in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 12 through 14. Jesus warns his disciples that they would be prosecuted and 
would be persecuted rather and would be brought before kings and governors and he says in verse 13 this will be your opportunity to bear witness Verse 14, settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. Wow. I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. So what Jesus said supports what Peter is saying. How is it that we are ready to give a reason for the hope that we have? By honoring Christ, treasuring him, cherishing him in our hearts, not by thinking about what we are going to say in that moment ahead of time. The work that we need to do is the work of treasuring Christ. It makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, the more you love someone or something and, and, and the more you regard it and esteem it, the more you love to talk about it. Or, or, and the easier it is to talk about it. Yes? How might someone ask you about the reason for your hope? How do you think that conversation might go? Maybe right now is a prime moment for it. Maybe somebody would say to you, how is it that you are not afraid right now? Why are you not anxious and worried and angry like so many other people? How is that? Maybe this is exactly the kind of thing that Peter is talking about, that suffering can be turned around to be an opportunity for blessing, an opportunity to be a witness for the hope of Jesus Christ. Maybe your answer could be something like this spoken in gentleness and respect and humility with a good conscience maybe you could say something like this well i have spent time getting to know jesus through the bible and through the holy spirit and the more i learn of him the more I love him. I have come to treasure him and cherish him in my heart and I am not afraid because of him, because I trust in him. I have learned to relinquish my own control and trust in him because he is worth trusting and worth living for. And he can make something beautiful out of something difficult. He's what I want more than anything. And I believe what Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things uh, to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And it should be done with gentleness and respect, not with, a, with an argumentative, indignant spirit not in anger. Peter seems to be saying that having a good conscience is a necessary part of being ready to give a reason for your hope. And I think that's true. You know, if you have just uh, snapped at your children or been cranky at home, Satan will use that against you in that moment. He'll say, things to you that aren't true. He'll say, you can't talk about hope. You're hopeless. 
you can't even be nice to your own family. How can you possibly love your neighbor when you aren't even loving your own family well? Our behavior matters all of the time. There are no vacations from pure conduct. We never know when the Lord will give us an opportunity to share our hope. You know, we worry a lot about what we will say at the time. We should worry more about whether we are really cherishing Christ in our hearts, whether we are cultivating love for him and praying for greater gentleness and humility and love and whether we're striving to keep our consciences clear. We need to cultivate our love for Jesus all the time so that we are overflowing with hope. And then maybe, just maybe, somebody might even ask us about it. Peter concludes that paragraph in verse 17 by saying, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. That is a powerful statement. That means that it is possible that it could actually be God's will that we should suffer for doing good. And I'm really wondering if some of us even have a category in our brains for that. We are so programmed to think if we do good, we'll get good in, re in return. But it doesn't always work that way. It could possibly be God's will for us to suffer for doing good. That God could allow wrong to happen to us without being sinful or wrong himself. Now that is a mind-bending thought. But I know that it's true. I have seen it work itself out in my own life. I have seen God use even my own sin for his glory, for my growth, and for my good without him ever being the author of that sin and being guilty of no wrong whatsoever. Now, if that sounds sort of strange to you, let me draw your attention to Acts chapter 4, verses 27 and 28. This is what it says. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And you know what that was. It was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The greatest evil that the world has ever known was the murder of God's own son. There has never been, nor will there be, a more heinous act of cruelty, brutality, and treason than that. And God's own word says that his hand and his plan predestined it to take place. It can be possible that God wills us to suffer for doing good without ever doing anything wrong himself. His own son suffered more than we ever will for doing the greatest good that the world has ever seen, purchasing our freedom for us, redeeming us with his own blood. And God caused it and he orchestrated this horrible event without ever doing anything wrong himself. That is a mind-blowing, mysterious thing. This chapter, this whole book, in fact, can be a little tough for us to swallow. 
we in the West, uh, in America in particular, haven't really suffered very much. We think that it's normal for Christians to live free from persecution, to be fairly normalized in society. Most of the rest of the world, for most of history, believers have not had things as easy as we have had. The threat of danger and death even was not uncommon. Right now, because of COVID-19, we are feeling this new and uncomfortable sense of how fragile and tenuous life really is. And that feels strange and alien to us. But it would have been generally understood by most of the rest of the world to be fairly normal and typical. It's closer to what most of the rest of the world has experienced than our generalized sense of safety and, and being in control and thinking that we're all gonna live to be 80 years old. The truth is it's probably not normal to fail to see how tenuous life is. It's probably normal to feel it. And it's probably better for our souls that we do. Even out of our small amount of suffering, we have still managed to, to develop this sort of health and wealth idea uh, of uh, the prosperity gospel that preaches that nobody should ever be sick or sad or poor. That God wants to deliver you from every single possible suffering you could ever encounter. But here, Peter is saying that unjust suffering could actually be God's will for you and that it is a blessing that you will receive a blessing for it, if not here and now, then with him in heaven. Peter moves in the very next paragraph in verse 18 to the greatest argument to substantiate his claim for the whole previous paragraph, that we will sometimes suffer for doing good, and if we do, we are blessed because Jesus also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Talk about not being fair. That was the ultimate in injustice, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus was willing to let fairness pass him by so that he could accomplish this enormous thing to bring us to God. I love that line, to bring us to God. It explains just what the cross accomplished. We had been separated from God because of our sin and Jesus did the work of removing that separation making it possible to bring us to God. He was the final atonement for our sin. We cannot work our way to God by being good or doing good. Jesus already did that. He is the perfect sacrifice in our place. It was that great exchange, the righteous for the unrighteous. Our work is to believe and trust and obey and honor Christ in our hearts as holy, to treasure him and cherish him and love him and let him be our sanctuary. Let him be our hope filler. And maybe, just maybe, someone might ask us why we have hope. Father, we ask that you would help us, that you would keep us free from fear, that we would honor Christ in our hearts, that we would love you, and that we would be ready to give a reason because we cherish you. Fill us with yourself. Be our sanctuary. Fill us with hope. And in your timing, may you give us those divine appointments. May somebody ask us that we may give glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Thanks. See you next week.